So the idea that coded information stored in a gene is being used to make a protein is, a, is as I said, the central dogma of biology. This is really the crux of how um, life uh, works. Okay, the overall process is known as protein synthesis and we will now look into the detail of the two main stages of protein synthesis which are transcription and translation. So transcription is the coded information on the gene is copied onto a strand of messenger RNA which can then leave the nucleus. So that's the first stage is that you've got some DNA and you need to copy that code onto another uh, molecule called messenger RNA. In translation what happens is a ribosome reads that messenger RNA code and assembles relevant amino acids into a polypeptide. So, in transcription, the gene on the DNA molecule unwinds and hydrogen bonds are broken between the two strands. The enzyme RNA polymerase catalyzes the formation of a complementary messenger RNA copy of the template or non-coding strand. The RNA polymerase binds to a promoter region, which is usually somewhere between 100 and 120 base pairs long, upstream of the coding region. Then it moves its way along that template strand and uh, assembles the messenger RNA molecule. The bases are complementary to the DNA. However, remember that because this is RNA, that uracil is used instead of thymine. So if this was the DNA code, then this would be the messenger RNA code that has been transcribed from it. Now the whole point of doing this is that the DNA stays in the nucleus. It's very important. Um, imagine again going back to the Lego model idea that actually if you wanted to build your Lego model you had to go and there's only one set of instructions and they were stored in the library and you could go to the library and you could take a photocopy of them and then you could take that photocopy home with you. It's a bit like that really. The DNA is so important, it's stored in the nucleus, it's a big molecule and we don't need the whole thing, we need a small section of this code at this particular time. So we just photocopy the page that we need. So messenger RNA takes essentially a copy uh, of that section of DNA of the gene and that messenger RNA is nice and small so it can pass through the nuclear pores and out into the cytoplasm for the next stage of protein synthesis, which is translation. So remember in translation that a ribosome reads this messenger RNA code and assembles the relevant amino acids. So let's look into that process in more detail. There are two molecules that are needed for this process to happen, the ribosome and another type of RNA called transfer RNA or tRNA. Uh, so the ribosome, a ribosome is made up from uh, ribosomal RNA and protein and its job is to bind the messenger RNA and to read the code. And it's got two uh, parts to its structure, the large subunit and the small subunit um, and it reads the messenger RNA three bases at a time which is called a codon. Each three bases is called a codon. Each three bases will code for a particular amino acid and this wheel here is a coding wheel that you can use to, to work out what a particular uh, RNA code um, or codon would, uh, which, what amino acid that would code for. Look at the wheel here, you start in the middle and you read outward. So if your codon was U, A, uh, C, you'd read U, A, C outwards and you get to T, Y, R, tyrosine. So that would be that particular amino acid. Notice the little key there with the start and the stop. Quite often you get a codon at the beginning to signal for the, mess for the ribosome to start um, making a polypeptide and you get a codon at the end, a stop codon, to tell the ribosome when to stop. Transfer RNA um, is found free in the cytoplasm um, and it has this very nice clover leaf shape, uh, very recognisable, um, and there are hydrogen bonds that are joint that is uh, allowing that structure to form. It's a single strand because it's RNA but those bonds there are hydrogen bonds giving it this particular shape. There are three complementary bases at the bottom um, that can match to the complementary codon on the messenger RNA, and then, uh, which is called the anticodon. And then at the top, there, there are three exposed bases at the opposite end, which correspond to a particular amino acid, so that's the amino acid binding site. 
So in translation, what happens is the ribosome moves along the messenger RNA. It will start a start codon, and then it will start to move along. And the transfer RNA, which is selected based on the anticodon matching the codon, and that will have the appropriate amino acid attached to the amino acid binding site. This happens with the second codon as well, so there's two transfer RNAs uh, there at the same time. A uh, peptide bond forms between those two amino acids, and then that first transfer RNA is free to be released, and the ribosome will move along to the next codon. And uh, this process continues and continues and continues and continues until a polypeptide has formed um, and the messenger RNA uh, and ribosome detach from this process because a stop codon is read by the ribosome. The polypeptide is now formed and this is what we call the primary structure of the protein. So now it will probably go on to the Golgi for it to be processed, for it to be folded into its 3D shape, maybe for other molecules to be added on to give the protein its full structure and function. The messenger RNA is released by the ribosome and can be reused, and the ribosome will also be able to start the process all over again um, somewhere else in the cell. So what happens to the transfer RNA molecules when they get released? Well, they can also be reused. Um, you need an enzyme called amino acyl transfer RNA synthase, which binds first of all with an amino acid and activates it by adding energy from ATP, and then it selects an empty uh, transfer RNA with the correct specific anticodon, and they, it can then bind this activated amino acid to the free transfer RNA molecule, and then you've, you've got this transfer RNA with the correct amino acid on it, again, ready to be reused in protein synthesis again. In reality, usually more than one ribosome works on a strand of messenger RNA at one time. It's not just one ribosome moving its way along. There may be lots of different ribosomes working its way on a particular, uh, trans uh, on a particular piece of messenger RNA. This picture here is of a bacterial polysome with nine ribosomes producing multiple copies of the polypeptide all at once. Um, just to talk about gene splicing briefly as well, uh, remember that you've got, in a gene, you've got introns and ex exons. The, the exons are the important coding parts. The introns uh, are need to be removed by splicing. But actually what happens in the process of splicing is that you can leave in or, uh, or take out certain exons. So you don't always splice the gene in the same way. So actually one gene, depending on what exons are left in or taken out, can actually code for all sorts of different polypeptides. So around 90%, 95% of human genes can undergo splicing. And in this way, the 20,000 human genes that we have in our genome can actually code for hundreds of thousands of proteins, more than just you'd expect from those particular 20,000 genes.